Thank you for standing by. Good day, everyone, and welcome to the Boeing Company's first quarter 2020 earnings conference call. Today's call is being recorded. The management discussion and slide presentation, plus the analyst question and answer session, are being broadcast live over the Internet. To ask a question on today's conference, please press the digit 1, followed by the digit 0 on your touchtone telephone. Again, it is 1-0 for questions. After pressing 1-0, you will hear that you've been placed in queue. Pressing 1-0 again will take you out of queue and may prevent you from being able to ask a question. At this time, for opening remarks and introductions, I am turning the call over to Ms. Marita Suteja, Vice President of Investor Relations for the Boeing Company. Ms. Suteja, please go ahead. Thank you, John, and good morning. Welcome to Boeing's first quarter 2020 earnings call. I'm Marita Suteja, and with me today are David Calhoun, Boeing's President and Chief Executive Officer, and Greg Smith, Boeing's Executive Vice President, Enterprise Operations, and Chief Financial Officer. After management comments, we will conduct a question and answer session. In fairness to others on the call, we ask that you please limit yourself to one question. As always, we have provided detailed financial information in our press release issued earlier today. And as a reminder, you can follow today's broadcast and slide presentation through our website at boeing.com. Before we begin, I need to remind you that any projections, estimates, and goals we include in our discussion this morning are likely to involve risks, which are detailed in our news release, in our various SEC filings, and in the forward-looking statement disclaimer at the end of this web presentation. In addition, we refer you to our earnings release and presentation for disclosures and reconciliation of certain non-GAAP measures. Now, I will turn the call over to Dave Calhoun. Thank you, Marita, and good morning, everyone. I want to start by saying I hope you are all staying safe and healthy during this global crisis. I also want to thank my Boeing colleagues around the globe for everything they are doing to support each other our business, and our customers during these intensely challenging times. On behalf of Boeing, I'd like to recognize all of the public servants out there, from federal, state, and local authorities to frontline healthcare professionals and first responders, for the difficult decisions and the personal risks they are making to protect and care for all of us. Let's turn to the second slide, please. The COVID-19 pandemic is a global crisis like no other. This hits home for us personally and professionally. Across Boeing, we're focused on keeping our people and our communities safe. We're battling to stop the virus by taking every measure possible, including early implementation of virtual work, deep cleaning our work areas, adjusting work patterns, adding visual indicators to increase social distancing and temperature screening stations with no-touch thermal scanners, providing access to medical information around the clock, quarantining anyone potentially exposed to the virus, suspending operations where necessary, and more. We have doubled our paid leave policy for those who cannot work remotely when their sites are suspended. At sites where we've had to temporarily suspend operations, we've worked closely with our customers to ensure we maintain critical support for them. And before bringing our teams back to work, we've implemented objective and rigorous steps aligned with federal and state guidance to ensure safe and orderly restart of operations. Earlier this week, we announced that we will resume operations at our Boeing South Carolina site beginning on May 3rd. This moves This move brings back our final production site that was temporarily suspended as a result of COVID-19. We're also doing everything we can to support our global supply chain health. A number of our suppliers have suspended or reduced their operations, resulting in some supply shortages for our own operations. In some cases, this contributed to our site suspension decisions. We've taken taken mitigating actions where we can but supply disruption remains a key watch item for us. At the other end of our value chain, we continue to support our commercial airplanes and services customers as their own business slows to a trickle. We've also focused on meeting the commitments to our defense and space customers. Given the swift and severe nature of this COVID-19 shock, 
To preserve the long-term competitiveness of our company as well as our industry, we are intensely focused on ensuring liquidity through the immediate crisis. We welcome that some 26 countries, including the United States, have announced economic support packages worth more than $100 billion, specifically targeting the aerospace and airline sectors. The aerospace industry relies on a global shared supply chain, and the aviation sector supports 3.6% of the global GDP, generating more than 65 million jobs worldwide. In the U.S., we applaud the administration and Congress for working together to pass the CARES Act, which will be critical to supporting the nation's entire aerospace manufacturing sector, which comprise 2.5 million jobs and 17,000 suppliers. We expect that programs coming out of the bill and funding options the government is putting in place will provide support to help the credit markets function again, providing the liquidity that is vital to our industry's ability to bridge recovery. The $25 billion support package agreed to by the U.S. airlines and the government is a pivotal step toward maintaining the aviation pillar of the U.S. economy, even if full recovery will take years, not months. Knowing that the U.S. airline industry has critical financial support through the pandemic allows us to plan our production and services system for the medium and long-term impact on air travel. Greg will go through our liquidity situation in more detail a bit later, but let me just say we believe that government support will be critical to ensuring our industry's access to liquidity. We continue to evaluate options in the capital markets as well as funding options from the U.S. government via the U.S. Treasury and various federal reserve programs. We've also taken other aggressive liquidity steps, including drawing down on a term loan, reducing operating costs, suspending dividend payments, terminating share repurchase authorization, reducing or deferring non-critical spend, and accelerating some progress payment receipts with the help from our defense customers. Additionally, we are working to resize and reshape our business, starting at the top with our leadership structure. We are consolidating roles, simplifying processes, and focusing accountabilities. As part of this reorganization, I've asked Greg Smith, whom most of you know well, to take additional responsibilities leading our enterprise manufacturing, supply chain, and services functions, in addition to his CFO and strategy roles. Before I turn to our longer-term business environment and the steps we're taking to prepare for it, I want to call out the selfless contributions Boeing employees have made to the broader fight against the coronavirus. They've been producing protective face shields for distribution to healthcare professionals, have flown our aircraft on missions to transport critical healthcare supplies around the world, donated masks, gloves, and other equipment and contributed hundreds of thousands of dollars to food centers for people in need. And that's just a partial list. Now I'd like to turn the attention to the outlook for our industry highlighted on slide three. The air travel industry has never seen anything quite like this. The latest IATA forecast projects full year passenger traffic to be down 48% this year compared to 2019 as global economic activity slows down due to the COVID-19 and the government's severely restricting travel to contain the spread of that virus. Here in the U.S., passenger traffic at this moment in time is down 95% compared to a year ago. Airlines are cutting back operations dramatically. As they assess their businesses, they're making difficult decisions that result in grounding fleets, deferring airplane orders, postponing acceptance of completed orders, and slowing down or stopping payments. They are also accelerating aircraft retirements and requiring fewer services. The, fundamental, the, the fundamentals that have driven air travel for the past five decades and doubled air traffic over the past two decades remain intact. We believe this industry will recover but it will take two to three years for travel to return to 2019 levels, and it will be a few years beyond that for the industry to return to long-term growth trends. Our outlook is informed by decades of analysis and insights on customer behavior, 
including how the industry has reacted to prior market shocks. We incorporated assumptions related to a prolonged recession and potential consolidation within the industry uh, in our assessment. The picture is dynamic and subject to many unknowns, but as we see it today, narrow-body narrow airplanes will lead the way to recovery, trailed by wide-body fleets as airlines progressively bring their networks back online. Therefore, wide-body passenger fleets will likely be more significantly impacted than narrow-body airplanes in the near term. A key driver in both segments will be the rate of retirements of older fleets. We expect our customers to look at their fleet planning strategies differently in light of these dynamics. More than 2,500 aircraft with 20 plus years of service were in active service prior to the crisis. Replacements will not be uniform as airlines will focus on the oldest and least efficient to retire. Some airlines have already made announcements to this effect. Airplanes that we plan to deliver this year will be 25 to 40 percent more fuel efficient than the airplanes that they're replacing. Our position is helped by the value proposition of our family of airplanes and the diversity of our backlog. This includes our market-leading 787 Dreamliner family, our unmatched cargo lineup, the world's largest and most efficient twin-engine jet, 777X, and the versatile 737 family. To balance the supply and demand given the COVID-19 shock and to preserve our long-term potential and competitiveness, we have decided to reduce the production rates of several of our commercial airplane programs. Let's turn to slide four. In the narrow body segment, we have assumed that we will resume 737 MAX aircraft production at low rates in 2020, as timing and conditions of return to service are better understood. We expect to gradually increase the production rate to 31 during 2021 with further gradual increases that correspond with market demand. The slower production rate ramp up reflects commercial airline industry uncertainty due to the impact of COVID-19. And the production rate ramp profile is also affected by the pace of delivery of our stored aircraft. We continue to see our new MAX airplanes creating capacity for growth and providing required replacements for older, less efficient airplanes. We will continue to work closely with our customers to review their fleet plans and make adjustments where appropriate to adapt to lower than planned 737 MAX production in the near term, provide more flexibility to deliver MAX airplanes in our backlog, and protect the value of the MAX family. Moving to the wide body segment, we now plan to reduce the 787 production rate to 10 per month in 2020, and then gradually reduce to seven per month by 2022. We will continue to evaluate the rate beyond 2022 to balance supply and demand. Our 787 Dreamliner family has a compelling value proposition, offering unparalleled fuel efficiency and range flexibility enabling carriers to optimize fleet and network performance, as well as profitability, as well as profitably expanding to new markets. Turning to the 777X, we've made progress on the 777X certification requirements and have resumed flight testing with the restart of our operations in the Puget Sound. We currently expect first delivery of the 777-9 to be in 2021 and will continue to manage the risks inherent in any development program, especially ones around certification in the post-MAX uh, environment and COVID-19 related impacts. We now expect to deliver 777 at an average rate of approximately two and a half per month in 2020. And due to the market uncertainties driven primarily by the impacts of COVID-19, we plan to reduce the combined 777, 777X production rate to three per month in 2021. We will take a measured approach to the 777X rate ramp as we will look to minimize the amount of change in corporation work by managing the number of aircraft produced prior to entry into service. 
On the 777, as I discussed earlier, we will continue to closely monitor the cargo market and carefully manage our skyline. Finally, we'll make no change to the 767 and 747 production rates at this time. These programs are targeted for the cargo market and approximately half of the 767 production line is dedicated to the tanker program. These rate decisions are based on our current assessment of the demand environment, taking into account a host of risks and opportunities. We will closely monitor the key factors that affect our skyline, including the wide body replacement cycle and the cargo market. We will maintain a disciplined rate management process and make adjustments as appropriate in the future. Now let's turn to slide five. The diversity of our portfolio is unmatched and our government services, defense and space programs will provide critical stability for us moving forward. In fact, our work in these areas accounted for 45% of our overall revenue in 2019 that will obviously increase in the year ahead. At defense, space, and security, we continue to see a healthy market with solid demand for our major platforms and programs, both domestically and internationally. Despite some near-term production impacts associated with our temporary suspension of operations at various locations, our portfolio of programs and technologies remains well aligned to our customers' missions. We are also well positioned with proven world-class platforms to address current needs and innovative, capable, and affordable new franchise programs for the future. For example, the President's budget request for fiscal year 21 supports key Boeing programs, including the V-22 and Apaches, 12 F-15 EX aircraft, and 15 K KC-46A tankers. It also requests funding in line with the expected development profile of future franchise programs, the MQ-25, the T-7A Red Hawk, and the MH-139A Gray Wolf, and our extra-large unmanned undersea vehicle. We have received broad support from the Pentagon for programs and products across the BDS portfolio. We are continuously improving performance of our existing platforms including the KC-46A tanker and our space programs. And while the tanker program has had delays and other challenges, with this month's agreement with the U.S. Air Force to develop and integrate a new remote vision system, we will ensure the KC-46 becomes the standard by which all future refueling aircraft are measured. Given its 2020 design update, no other tanker will have the technological capabilities of the KC-46. The men and women of the U.S. Air Force have our full commitment and our investment in the tanker reinforces that dedication. Our space teams completed the core stage of NASA's space launch system and learned key lessons from the CST-100 Starliner's orbital flight test. We will refly this test to demonstrate the quality of the Starliner system, paving the way for future crewed flights. It is the right thing to do for our NASA customer and the astronauts who ultimately fly on it. As you may recall, we provisioned for another uncrewed mission in our financials last quarter. On the services side, we are seeing a direct impact on our commercial supply chain business as fewer flights result in a decreased demand for our parts and logistics offerings. Our commercial customers are curtailing discretionary spend, such as modifications and upgrades and focusing on required maintenance. We anticipate accelerated retirement of older airplanes, which will result in a newer fleet when air travel resumes to previous levels, which will prolong the period of decreased demand for our commercial services offerings. Similar to commercial airplanes, we expect a multi-year recovery period for the commercial services business. The demand outlook for our government services business which in 2019 accounted for just under half of the BGS revenue, it remains stable. The strength of government services provides a strong foundation for our overall services business. We see growth in a number of government services areas, including ramp ups to support international customers with training, logistics, and supply chain offerings, as well as growth on key US programs. 
In summary, our industry is going to look very different as a result of this pandemic and the economic impact it has had on airlines and schedules around the world. The resulting reductions in the BCA production rates I outlined will require us to make similar adjustments in our infrastructure, our spending, and our workforce. We will be a smaller company for a while. We've worked hard to maintain the stability of our workforce, avoiding layoffs even though even through the suspension of max production. Doubling the length of time we pay employees impacted by the COVID-induced shutdown of Puget Sound, Charleston, and other sites. Bringing people back to work at those sites as soon as we safely could. But the sharp reduction in demand for our airplanes that we see out over the next several years won't support the size of the workforce we have today. At this time, we are taking action to reduce our workforce by approximately 10% of our roughly 160,000 employees by end of this year. Through the combination of voluntary layoffs, attrition, and involuntary layoffs as necessary. This is 10% of the total for our enterprise. We'll have to make even deeper reductions in areas that are most exposed to the condition of our commercial customers. More than 15% across commercial airplanes and services businesses, as well as our corporate functions. At the same time, the ongoing stability of our defense, space, and related services businesses will help us limit the overall depth of the cut. Of course, we will continue to monitor market conditions closely in light of the unpredictable factors currently driving it, and we will make ongoing adjustments as appropriate. We will continuously work to shape our business to compete in what we think the market will look like over the next five years. I shared this news with our employees this morning, and I committed to implementing these reductions as fairly, respectfully, and transparently as possible, and to providing as much support for our employees as we can through the duration of the global health emergency we are facing. Before I turn this over to Greg, I want to update you on a couple of other important topics. First, our progress on safely returning the 737 MAX to service. We're continuing our work on the safe return of the MAX to service, working closely with the FAA and other global regulators. Right now, we are focused on completing the software validation and required technical documentation that will precede a certification flight. Some of this documentation work has taken longer than we anticipated, and the coronavirus situation has also required some changes to how we do things, including working remotely and virtual meetings with our regulators. With that said, we've continued to make very solid progress and we currently expect that the necessary regulatory approvals will be obtained in time to support resumption of 737 MAX deliveries during the third quarter. Of course, the actual timing will ultimately be determined by our regulators. In the meantime, we have approximately 450 737 MAX aircraft built and stored and our MAX backlog has remained strong throughout this process at approximately 4,000 aircraft. They are the most fuel-efficient narrow-body planes in the market with useful lives well over 25 years. We have been working proactively with our customers to maintain the health of this backlog while responding to their needs. Turning to Embraer, we announced Saturday that we have terminated the agreement to establish a strategic partnership between our two companies covering both the planned commercial and defense joint ventures. We worked diligently for two years to finalize the transaction, but ultimately we could not come to resolution around critical unsatisfied conditions for the deal under our master transaction agreement. It is deeply disappointing, but we have, but we have had reached a point where continued negotiation was no longer helpful. And so we exercised the rights set out in the MTA to terminate the agreement. Looking ahead, we will continue to concentrate on what is most important across Boeing. To that end, I established six company priorities in January. They included returning the 737 MAX safely to service and earning back trust with our stakeholders. We are also committed to delivering excellence across our businesses and restoring our production health. And we are determined to invest in our future while always living our values. 
We will not lose sight of the importance of making investments that are critical to our future, such as the continued, such as continuing to progress on our development programs, such as the 777X and the 737 MAX 10. With that, let me turn it over to Greg for an update on our financial performance. Greg. Great. Thanks, Dave. And good morning, everyone. Uh, let's uh, please turn to slide six for our first quarter results. <clears throat> our first quarter results were primarily driven by the COVID-19 impacts and the 737 MAX grounding. Revenue, earnings per share, and operating cash were materially reduced. Prior to experiencing COVID-19 impacts, we were tracking well to meeting our original internal first quarter forecast. Our revenue of $16.9 billion reflects lower 737 MAX deliveries versus first quarter of last year, as well as fewer deliveries in the quarter due to COVID-19. Core earnings per share was negative $1.70, and earnings in the quarter were also impacted by a charge on the KC-46A tanker program. Before we discuss the segment performance, let me touch on 737 MAX. As Dave mentioned, we currently have approximately 450 737 MAX aircraft built and stored in inventory. We continue to monitor and maintain these aircraft on a regular basis, including completing more than 1,000 flights over the past year. Also, as mentioned, primarily due to COVID-19 impacts, we've revised our assumptions on timing and the profile of deliveries from storage and the production rate ramp. Delivery from storage will continue to be priority one post assisting our customers with their return to service. These aircraft and storage will convert to significant operating cash over the period of time it takes to deliver these aircraft out of inventory. In preparation for our first quarter financial statements, we made certain assumptions including timing of initial deliveries, production, and rate ramp profiles. We've assumed that we will begin 737 MAX aircraft production at low rates during the second quarter of 2020 as timing and conditions of return to service and COVID-19 impacts are better understood. We expect to gradually increase the production rate to 31 during 2021 and expect further gradual increases to correspond with market demand. We've assumed that the timing of the regulatory approvals will enable the 737 MAX deliveries to resume during the third quarter of 2020. We've also assumed that the majority of the 737 MAX aircraft produced during the grounding and included within inventory will be delivered during the first year after the resumption of deliveries, although, again, at a slower pace than we previously assumed. Again, the slower production and delivery rate ramp reflects commercial airline industry impacts as a result of COVID-19. In the first quarter, we, we reduced the number of aircraft in the 737 accounting quantity by 400 units as a result of the reduction to planned production rates due to COVID-19. The reduction to the planned production rates will, will result in further increases in cost to produce undelivered aircraft primarily due to additional fixed cost absorption. This reduces program margins after deliveries resume. In addition, abnormally low production rates will extend for a longer period once production resumes, and, and as expected to result in around a billion dollars of additional abnormal production costs, increasing the total from approximately $4 billion to $5 billion. These will be expensed as incurred, and we expect the majority of these abnormal production costs to be expensed this year. During the first quarter, we expense 797 million of abnormal production costs. Any changes to these assumptions could require us to recognize additional financial impacts. There's no material change to our estimate of potential concessions and other considerations to customers for disruption related to the max grounding and associated delivery delays. In the first quarter, we reduced the liability balance by approximately $700 million, primarily through cash payments. We continue to address the impact individually, 
customer by customer, including assessing the impacts of the max disruption is having on their operations in light of COVID-19 pandemic. We also continue to express, expect any concessions or other considerations to be provided over a number of years with the cash impact to be more front loaded in the first few years. <clears throat> Let's now move to the commercial airplanes on slide seven. Our commercial airplane business revenue decreased to 6.2 billion during the quarter, reflecting lower deliveries, primarily by the 737 MAX grounding, as well as impacts of COVID-19. Operating margins declined to negative 33.3% due to the following. Lower delivery volume, 797 million of abnormal costs from the temporary suspension of the MAX program mentioned earlier. A $336 million charge related to the 737 next generation frame fitting component, also known as the pickle fork and the repair costs associated with that. Lower 787 margins, primarily due to rate reductions related to COVID-19 and $137 million of abnormal production costs from the temporary suspension of Puget Sound operations in response to COVID-19. We saw approximately one week impact of these costs in the quarter. We expect to see additional abnormal costs in the second quarter related to suspension of our Puget Sound and also our Charleston sites due to COVID-19 through April and early May. The 787 program margin decreased in the quarter, primarily due to lower planned production rates, which drove additional fixed cost absorption, higher disruption costs, and a 100-unit contraction of the accounting quantity, requiring us to recognize the remaining deferred balance over fewer aircraft. BCA backlog includes over 5,000 airplanes valued at $352 billion. As Dave mentioned earlier, the COVID-19 pandemic has significantly impacted aircraft demand. We're taking actions as a result of these new realities by adjusting production rates and our infrastructure, which will position us for the future and help us bridge to recovery. These rate decisions are based on current assessment of our demand environment, and we will continue to closely monitor these factors that affect our skyline and make rate adjustments as appropriate in the future. Excuse me, let's now move to defense space and security on slide eight. First quarter revenue decreased to $6 billion, primarily driven by the charge on the KC-46A tanker. BDS operating margins of negative 3.2%, primarily due to pre-tax charge of $827 million for the KC-46A tanker, of which $551 million was driven by the costs associated with the agreement signed in April with the U.S. Air Force to develop and integrate our new remote vision system, while the remaining costs reflect productivity inefficiencies and COVID-19 related factory disruption. A number of other programs, including the VC-25B, were also impacted by COVID-19, further reducing margin in the quarter. There are provisions of the CARE Act in our contracts that may provide an opportunity to recover some of these costs related to COVID-19 over time, and we'll continue to evaluate them. During the quarter, BDS-1 key contracts were $6 billion, and our backlog now stands at $64 billion, with 28% from outside the United States. Let's turn to Boeing Global Services results on slide nine. In the first quarter, Global services revenue was flat at $4.6 billion, reflecting higher government services volume, largely offset by lower commercial service volume due to COVID-19. BGS operating margin increased to 15.3%, primarily due to favorable government service performance. During the quarter, BGS won key tra- contract awards worth approximately $4 billion, which brings its backlog now to approximately $23 billion. We only saw the beginning of the impact of COVID-19 on our commercial services demand for the first quarter, and we expect COVID-19 to have significantly larger impact on the BGS business in future periods. To respond to this changing market dynamic, 
we are taking a number of proactive steps to right-size and ultimately better position our business for these new market realities. These include employment actions, as well as proactively taking steps to right-size our inventory and tailor our portfolio to ensure that we're positioned to serve our customers, both through this challenging time and when the industry begins to recover. Let's turn now to cash flow on slide 10. During our last earnings call, we shared that the use of cash flow this year is expected to be greater than 2019. Clearly, COVID-19 has made our cash flow situation even more challenging in 2020. The shift and severe impact it has had on our airlines and the global economy has added significant pressure on our cash receipts. Operating cash flow for the first quarter was negative $4.3 billion, driven by the lower commercial airplane delivery volume, advanced payments, and impact of COVID-19 and timing of receipts and expenditures. And as discussed, COVID-19 also caused delivery and production disruption in the quarter. Also in the quarter, we spent $428 million on capital expenditures, paid $1.2 billion in dividends, dividends, which were declared last December, and paid $2.2 billion of debt maturity. COVID-19 pandemic clearly presenting unprecedented challenges for our industry and our company. We're taking a number of actions to accelerate and conserve cash. In March 2020, we suspended payment of our dividend until further notice. Since April 2019, we've suspended our share repurchase program. And in March 2020, our board of directors terminated its prior authorization to repurchase shares of the company's common stock. And as previously mentioned, we have taken actions to reduce production rates in our commercial business. And we have furloughed certain employees, and as Dave discussed, we'll be taking workforce actions through a combination of voluntary layoffs, attrition, and involuntary layoffs as necessary. We have and we will continue to reduce discretionary spending. Also, reducing or deferring research and development and capital expenditures, but we will continue spending in key priorities and technologies that will be critical to our future and to our customers' success. We're working with our government customers to assess and mitigate any impacts associated with COVID-19 pandemic. We appreciate the steps that the Department of Defense has taken to work with its industry partners to improve near-term liquidity in the forms of increased progress payment rates and reductions in withholds, among other initiatives. In pursuit of the CARES Act, we're also deferring certain tax payments. We are working with our supply chain partners to carefully manage liquidity, but at the same time doing everything we can do to manage the stability and health of our supply chain as we manage through this demand shock to protect the long-term health of the U.S. aerospace industry. We are focused on the best ways to keep liquidity flowing through our business and to our supply chain through this period. The most important source of liquidity for our suppliers is good credit of the OEM and Tier 1 suppliers. As I mentioned prior to COVID-19, we were tracking our internal first quarter and full year forecast. Also, as mentioned, COVID-19 is clearly putting additional pressure on 2020 cash flow, and we expect operating cash to be more negative in 2020. We also expect a slower cash flow recovery going forward due to the revised 737 MAX delivery profile and the new wide-body production rates. Outside commercial airplanes and commercial services, we expect cash flow generation to be solid and in line with earnings on the government side of our business. Let's now move to slide 11, and we'll discuss liquidity position and finance planning. As previously discussed, we drew down the $13.8 billion delay draw term loan early to help shore up our liquidity position as we work through the current challenges. Also in the quarter, we paid down $2.2 billion of debt maturity, resulting in an $11.6 billion increase, bringing the total debt balance now to $38.9 billion. We ended the quarter with $15.5 billion of cash in marketable securities, 
Again, due to COVID-19, our daily use of cash has continued to reduce this balance. We continue to have access to our $9.6 billion revolving credit facility, which to date has not been drawn upon. Given the significant impact of COVID-19 on our operating cash, we are proactively managing our cash position and working to access additional liquidity. We believe the government support will be critical to ensure in our industry's access to liquidity, and we continue to evaluate options in the capital markets, as well as funding options from the U.S. government via the U.S. Treasury and various Federal Reserve programs. We will continue to review all available access and select the best options for our company. We believe through a combination of our actions and our ability to access additional liquidity, we will, we will be able to obtain sufficient cash to fund our operations. Managing our liquidity and balance sheet leverage are top priorities as we navigate this challenging environment. We plan to immediately reduce our debt levels once our cash flow generation returns to more normal levels. Again, we will not lose sight of making necessary investments in our business, our people, new technology, and better processes and tools that are critical to our future. This includes recent organizational changes Dave mentioned to simplify and streamline roles and responsibilities and prepare now for the post-pandemic industry footprint. As part of that, I'm excited to take on a new role and work closely with our teams across the business units to drive operational excellence and restore production and supply chain health as we and the broader aerospace industry recover from COVID-19 pandemic and rebuild stronger. The current environment is obviously very challenging and extremely dynamic. We're staying fully engaged with our customers, continually ask, assessing the changing environment to ensure we have the right minded about the near and longer term demand. And as we discussed, we're taking and will continue to take appropriate action to bridge the recovery. With our company and the US aerospace industry and the 17,000 suppliers supporting it can remain healthy and be well positioned to capture future opportunities when we all emerge on the other side of this crisis. With that, I'll turn it back over to Dave for some closing comments. Thanks, Greg. We're in an unprecedented period for the industry and the world, and I'm humbled and privileged to lead the talented people of Boeing. We are and will be taking the right action to navigate through this pandemic, support our workforce, maintain supply chain continuity and stability, and position for a changing market. We continue to support our defense customers in their critical national security missions, we are progressing toward the safe return to service of the 737 MAX, and we are driving safety, quality, and operational excellence into all that we do every day. And through it all, we are keeping the health of our employees, their families, and our communities top of mind. We believe the long-term industry fundamentals remain strong and air travel will recover. Our portfolio of products and technology is well positioned and we're confident we will emerge from this crisis and thrive again as a leader of our industry. History has proven Boeing is a company that rises to these challenges. With that, uh, Greg and I will, will be happy to uh, take your questions. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, in order that your question be clearly heard, we ask that you not use a speakerphone, cell phone, or phone headset. Please use your handset to ask a question. If you're on a speakerphone, please be sure your mute function is switched off so your signal can reach our equipment. As a reminder, in the interest of time, we are asking that you limit yourself to one single part question. Our first question comes from Peter Arment with Baird. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, good morning, Dave. Greg, thanks Thanks for, for your morning, time. Um, I don't know whether this question is for, for Dave or Greg, but maybe just uh, Dave. You know, the, the pace of deliveries for the stored fleet over once you get back to certification in Q3 over, I guess, the majority you're going to be looking to deliver over kind of a 12-month period, and then squaring that against the warming up of the production line and trying to get to a target of 31 aircraft just seems like a lot of deliveries. Maybe you could just kind of walk us through kind of how you're arriving at that. I know that that's 
just given the backdrop of what we're seeing in air travel right now. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, number one, uh, as you probably know um, and has been reported on widely, we, we have been having conversations, intense ones, for the better part of a month with our MAX customers about delivery and when to take them. And, and, and it's, it's a, I would call it a, a, a wide variation with respect to what they ask for. Some want them right away. Some of them want to defer for quite a while. Uh, our assessment is reflected in these numbers um, based on those interactions. And yeah, there's more to, to be had, but we think it sort of accurately reflects that. And if anything, in light of the now all of the government resources that have been provided to many of the airlines, which a month ago were still in, still in doubt, um, some of that has settled down. So uh, now I, with respect to priorities, our priority will be to uh, deliver the finished goods inventory that we have. Um, and as a result, the production rate is the one that we will sort of uh, change uh, based on what happens in the marketplace. Marketplace gets more robust for any reason. Uh, we'll increase that rate sooner rather than later. And if it defers and or gets any worse, we will do the opposite. So the, the variable in this is going to be the production rate. And the rate we've chosen now, this 31 number, and a, and a, and a slow pace to get to 31, reflects everything we know about the conversations with all of our uh, MAX customers. Thank you. And our next question is from Rob Spingarn with Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Good morning. Good morning, Rob. Good morning. Uh, Greg, this, one, this one's for you, Greg. Let's say that in the seven, eight, seven, 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 eight, sevens per month, and 31 maxes in 2022, and I guess three triple sevens is the new normal. What kind of free cash flow profile would you have with that, assuming stable BDS and a reasonable recovery at BGS. So I'm talking about 2022 now. Yeah, yeah. Well, clearly, Rob, uh, to to Peter's question to uh, to Dave, that that is the you know I would say the single biggest driver. To your point, we've kind of laid out at least currently how we're thinking about production rates in that time frame. But the single biggest driver of that will be max, and um, and not only you know priority one delivering off that ramp. Um, uh, is being the first step, but then that production rate um, increase from there. And so obviously the market's going to inform us, um, you know, how, how we can, if we have the right profile uh, that we've established today based on the numerous discussions we've had with the customer, but that will be the single biggest driver, you know, within that period. And then I'd say outside of that is the triple seven to triple seven X, as you know, you know, triple seven, um, X is a use of cash this year. We'll peak this year. We expect it to be a use of cash next year, but then it's cash flow positive um, in the following year. So that transition that that will take place will be will be key to 2022 um, cash flow. Obviously, we expect 2022 to be um, much better than what we're experiencing this year um, and next. But those will be the real, I'll say, key operational drivers. That uh, that will allow us to get there. But, but Greg, is there any way to quantify what cash flow looks like with seven eight seven at at seven a month, half of what the the peak rate has been, and and with the seven thirty seven just a little over half what that targeted mature rate would be? How do we think about what cash flow looks like in that environment? Yeah, I don't, I you know, Rob, I don't want to get into specifics on that time frame because obviously, as we sit here today, 2022 feels like a long way away, uh, considering you know what we're we're navigating. But it'll be, you know, obviously it'll be positive cash flow in that period from those key drivers. Um, you now, how how positive? Um, it'll really obviously depend on rates even further going out, um, and not delivery rates as much as, but production rates and advances um, that, uh, that could impact 2022 positively or, or negatively, depending on where rates go from there. But those will be the big drivers. And like I said, now with these production rates we've established, that's our, that's our best assessment at this time. And that, that could change and we'll, we'll, we'll size accordingly 
to do that. But 2022 starts to you know feel like a, a more normal year, um, certainly than than what we've experienced in 19 and what we're going to experience in 20. Okay, fair enough. Thank you, Greg. Thanks, Rob. Our next question is from the line of Seth Seifman with J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Um, thanks, thanks very much, and uh, good morning. Um, just morning, a couple Seth. of questions, uh, morning. A couple of questions about liquidity and, and capital structure. I mean, we've got the 15 billion of, of cash on the balance sheet, but also about five billion of short-term debt and you know burning cash. Um, can you talk about the timeline? Um, can you talk about maybe the the sixty billion dollar plus number for the industry that you uh guys put out there several weeks ago and kind of what was in that and how you think about it now. And can you talk about whether Boeing needs to be an investment grade rated company? Yeah. Um maybe maybe I'll let Dave address the industry and then and then I'll follow up. The sixty billion dollar number of course was uh put together early in this uh process and Credit markets were as tight as they could be, and we were trying to assess, you know, the fragility of mostly the supply chain, frankly. And um, we do have some weak, weak or soft spots in that supply chain. Um, but with, res with respect to Boeing's role in the health of the supply chain, I think everybody here knows that the real leverage for us is when we are sound and our credit is good and we place orders against all of our supply chains, then, in fact, that provides the liquidity that they need ultimately to make the adjustments that they're going to make in response to our production rates. So that in and of itself, whatever ultimately we do and the, and the liquidity we provide to our suppliers is most important. But our number was meant to represent sort of the whole, all of the supply chain, 17,000 suppliers, um, the tier ones and the support that the tier ones might need. And I can't speak for that. Um, and so, uh, again, I, a $60 billion number was, in fact, an industry number, not a Boeing-specific number. Right. Yeah. And then, Seth, just uh, as a, um, your second part of your question around being investment grade, you know, certainly um, we would like to maintain um, being investment grade. And I think, as you've heard and seen, that we're doing everything possible to do that. But, um, look, the market's probably going to impact that more, more than anything. Um, fortunately, as you know, you know, we, we started a position of strength with our balance sheet that's allowed us to navigate it. And as Dave and I outlined, you know, we're taking all the right steps to uh, manage liquidity day in and day out and prepare for recovery on the other side. But um, at the end of the day, it's going to it's going to be what it's going to be um, on the on the investment grade. But but certainly we prefer to stay investment grade and again I think we're doing all the taking all the right actions to uh try to maintain that. Thank you. And our next question is from uh Carter Copeland with Melius Research. Please go ahead. Hey good morning gentlemen. Thanks for the time. Morning Carter. Hi good um, morning. Just uh Greg just quickly on the on the eight seven I just want to make sure you I, I heard you right on the the block reduction. I think you said 100 units. I wondered if you could yeah. just give some color on why why to reduce that. Is or is that a lack of visibility around you know unsold pricing? And then just with respect to that, what that did to the deferred production. I mean, it looks like a two billion dollar number in the quarter. That would kind of imply that you've shaved that program margin down to a, a pretty razor thin level. Am I missing something in the math there? No, I think I think you got it. I think you got it right. I mean, the contraction in the in the cost space was driven by time, so um, it's staying within the five year period that we that we uh, have on on cost basis. So as a result of of uh, producing uh, fewer units, that caused us to contract that cost base by 100 units. I, I would say even with that contraction, when you look at margin going forward on the 787, even with the lower um, production rates, net-net on a unit basis holds up pretty well. And, and the real key drivers that, even with the lower volume, like I said, we're, we're, we're going to be impacted by that, you know, the fixed cost. But you kind of come back to the fundamentals on the, on the backlog and uh, the profile of the program going forward when you look at model mix, 
Um, you look at st supplier step down, um, and even even with our own productivity, um, it is impacted. Like I said, but but not impacted as much as I think some would some would expect. So I think those fundamentals. You, I would ask you know don't lose sight of those because they're still they're still a key driver to um, cash margin on the program. Yeah, it's just gap. All right, thank you yeah. for the color. Yeah. You got uh, just one yeah. other, maybe one other comment with respect to the market backdrop on the 787. Uh, the demand for the 87 is is pretty strong. Uh, our issue is, and our assumptions, and, and we think we're right, is that the international route structures are going to come back much slower than the uh, domestic ones, and as a result, the 87 suffers for that. Um, but otherwise, the airplane's performance, its utilization right now in the marketplace is pretty amazing. So uh, we feel good about the airplane, but this push over, based on the assumptions we've made, um, it, you know, it is what it is. Thanks for the color, gentlemen. You're welcome. And next we'll go to uh, Noah Papanek with uh, Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I wanted to try, uh, if at all possible, to get um, – precise or more precise on um, it, it's clearly challenging out there but but just how many of your customers are attempting to uh, revise their their position in the delivery skyline because it you know the the, the traffic growth numbers and just the way it feels it, it it looks and feels like you could imagine literally every single one of your customers having a conversation with you about deferring or canceling but you are maintaining 10 a month on the 87 for the year, which would suggest uh, that's not happening. I'm pretty surprised by that. You're telling us your conversations with your max customers suggest, you know, they still want the airplane, um, you know, some, you know, for a decent amount of them, somewhere close to where, where they, where they originally wanted it. So I don't know if there's any way to quantify, um, you know, what percentage of your customers are asking to move versus what percentage of your customers are just, sticking to what uh, they had previously, what percentage of the backlog you expect to be canceled. I'm just trying to get some kind of sense for, you know, the degree of turmoil in the immediate term uh, with, with your customer's ability to take airplanes. Well, so let me uh, take a swing at that. I, first of all, I'm, I'm going to assume if we haven't heard from literally all of our customers by now, we will um, with respect to what they would like to do um, and these discussions are uh, constructive, and we do everything in our power to defer when we can, swap where we can, um, et cetera. And remember, uh, a lot of our customers, all of them are invested uh, by, with respect to PDPs that, 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 of course, we have retained. So um, each of these discussions, believe it or not, has been quite uh, constructive and productive. And everything we know about their initial requests um, are reflected in our new production rates. Um, and it's not to suggest uh, that there isn't risk uh, remaining on the demand side, um, but we're not, you know, like, we're not looking through rose-colored glasses. We're, we're, we're actually doing uh, quite the opposite, which is to meet as many of these requests as we can, negotiate outcomes where we can, and we have a whole bunch of them, um, and then reflect that accurately in the product production rates and the forward the forward view, and that that is exactly where we sit. So um, anyway, it might, it's surprising, but you know the one thing that's probably surprised me a bit is the the extent extent to which this will accelerate fleet rationalization in the uh, customer base. Um, you know the scenario. We went from a growth a, a robust growth environment where even if they had plans to retire a portion of their fleet, they couldn't do it simply because the market was as robust as it was. And they've now gone to the polar opposite. And so this is that moment where rationalization efforts get big. And believe it or not, in some cases, it even, it even requires that maybe new airplanes uh, uh, be ordered simply to rationalize the, the, the fleet that they're trying to put out of business. So there's is a very interesting set of dynamics. Um, uh, the fleet planning efforts are in full swing for everybody. Um, and, uh, uh, again, I, I think we've reflected everything we know. Dave, when I went to look up how much of the market is sale leaseback, I reminded myself, I, I was surprised to remind myself how large that is. Um, the, 
a lot of the large publicly traded leasing companies have raised capital recently. You have state-owned customers, and you just have customers that had a good financial position coming into this. Is it reasonable to assume that that set of customers that I just described can can hold you, as challenging as things are, can hold you together through 2020 until things are normalized and you're growing again in 2021? Well, in my in my experience, and I lived through it in, in my life at GCAS back in the uh, you know post 9/11 world, uh, it turns out that that is exactly what uh, holds up, um, and uh, and we believe that in fact it will hold up again. Um, and a lot of the discussions we've had have been with um, financial markets and lessors, uh, as you would imagine. So, I think your assumption is correct, and part of our assumptions in this process reflect. The discussions we've had with uh, financial sources. So, uh, you know, I guess yes is the answer. Uh, I can't put an absolute number on it for you, but it's clearly reflected in our numbers. Thanks very much. Yeah. Our next question is from Doug Harned with Bernstein. Please go ahead. Uh, great. Thank you. Um, you know, on liquidity, th this morning, Airbus management described a lot of the same liquidity issues that you're describing today uh, with the focus on the supply chain's health. And, you know, it appears that the biggest cash risk that you're facing is also with the supply chain. You, you had, had the discussion around the $60 billion before. Um, you know, but when you look at the responsibility for the cash needs of suppliers, it crosses Boeing, it crosses Airbus with a lot of overlaps. You've got support potentially from governments and then the suppliers themselves. So it looks like there are a wide range of potential scenarios here for what the cash outcome could be for Boeing related to the supply chain. Can you talk about how you work with the different constituencies to try and address this? And can you give us a sense as to what the range of outcomes could be here as you look over the next year? Well, let me take a crack at this first. Um, uh, you know, the right order of business is is the one that is 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 going on right before our eyes, and the first is to get the airlines from the pre-COVID moment into the post-COVID moment, and for them to be uh, warm when they get there, so that they can begin that recovery process. Um, that in and of itself uh, puts some stability out there in the marketplace, um, and it allows us. Boeing to, to now reflect medium-term demand, long-term demand, and make the adjustments in accordance with that. We believe we have a balance sheet, um, and we believe we have tools available to us and credit markets that are open enough to us to be able to get from here to there and get there with room to spare. Um, and as we do that, our good credit then extends into the supply chain, and the supply chain then has to make a whole bunch of adjustments on their own to reflect the new production requirements at both Airbus and Boeing. Um, so, the, uh, again, the airlines uh, bridging, bridging that moment, uh, Boeing, Airbus, ha access to credit and their ability to finance from here to that medium-term moment, and then the supply chain's ability to now restructure themselves to meet that new demand, but always relying on our credit and always relying on our factories being open, that's a real advantage. Um, and then the tools that the CARES Act has put in place, um, and we do work closely with the, uh, the administration on trying to get them to understand where the soft spots might be in that overall supply chain and direct those tools to that supply chain. I mean, that's the process that's unfolding before our eyes. Um, believe it or not, I think it's robust and it's working. Um, and so, I'm not anticipating, at least at this moment in time, any big or serious repercussions from supply chain issues. In some, in some ways, just in the last two or three weeks, as governments have stepped up with their tools, et cetera, um, there's been a little more stability than there was uh, uh, just prior. So is it fair to say, as you and Greg look at the range of possible outcomes here, um, with respect to the suppliers, when you're talking about feeling fairly confident in this now, you're able to say you, you can take off, say, some worst-case scenarios that perhaps were there back when you mentioned that $60 billion, so that, mm -hmm. so that even under the sort of current worst case, you're, you're fairly confident you're, you're in solid shape for this year. We are. Um, and I, I, I know you would imagine, but uh, we have a lot of folks who help us with this, and we have stress tests 
the case that we're putting forward uh, in many, many ways that are much more difficult than what, than what we believe we're going to do. Um, and we do, we do get through it. And we do ultimately, when we do take on more debt, we also believe strongly that we're going to start paying it down. Now, at what rate we pay it down is the, is the real question. But when we get to uh, some form of stability at these production rates, and I believe we will, um, we'll be in good shape to begin, uh, begin that process of returning money to our uh, lenders. Okay, great. Thank you. Yep. Our next question is from Ron Epstein with Bank of America. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, good morning, guys. Um, morning, Ron. Maybe changing, changing the focus a little bit to product strategy. Um, with, with the Embraer deal um, not, not playing out and then NMA being off the table, how do you think about competing against Airbus, who has a product at the lower end of the market, and a product at the higher end of the narrow body market, where it seems like the the, the max is, it's 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 fine, but it's it's it, you know, how can I say it's sandwiched between aircraft that are optimized on both ends of the market by your competitor. So, particularly in an environment where you're constrained on your R and D spend and your development spend. Well, with respect to the max, um, uh, I, I have a lot more confidence in the the max and its place in the market. Um, then maybe the question implies um, we have a value prop that actually is is still pretty good um, in some ways if uh, if uh, if uh, airplane loads um, uh, want to get smaller as a result of a maybe a smaller set of passengers flying on them in the in the next several years um, it, it might it might actually play to us um, we have a robust backlog with it um, and um, we're not out of the product development business. Um, we're, we're, we're definitely in it. We are invested in capabilities with respect to manufacturing and engineering that we believe will offer a very differentiated product in whatever uh, 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 strategy we choose. Um, and we're fast at work at that stuff, and we continue to be at work on it. It will probably not be applied to an NMA, um, and I think we've conveyed that to the marketplace. Um, but this time, actually, in some of these market changes, and then those important technologies we're investing in, I actually I have a lot of faith both in the product that we currently serve it with, uh, and then secondly, the capabilities we'll bring to what whatever we eventually uh, develop as a next gen. Um, and in the meantime, on the wide body world, and in particularly in the freighter world, we like our strategies. We're going to continue to invest in it, and uh, you know I believe at the moment that's uh, that's our probably our biggest priority. So, um, and then at the low end, uh, you know, Embraer is not going away. They're going to fight, they're going to fight tooth and nail to win at that low end of the marketplace. And they'll, they'll battle Airbus, uh, uh, the former Bombardier in doing so. And I don't think that's going to move the market in any significant way and or affect the future of Boeing in any significant way. So anyway, that's, uh, uh, that's probably it in a nutshell. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Our next question is from Sheila Kayalu with Jeffries. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, good morning, Dave and Greg. Thank you for the time. Um, good morning, Sheila. Da good morning. Dave, you, Dave, you mentioned on uh, wide bodies. I'm just following up on this. You, you seem pretty comfortable that the bottom of demand is in. Given this is largely a replacement market and granted not uniform, what type of retirement rates are you thinking for the industry? Well, I don't, I don't have a, a, a retirement number on the tip of my tongue um suffice to say um you know there are going to the, the retirements are going to accelerate in my view um considerably and and airplanes are going to get put down permanently at a faster rate that's the most important part of this um that they get down they get put down permanently not that they just get parked um and so i i do think that actually is going to uh, play to our favor um uh, I love where our product line is. I think it's it's fundamentally advantaged. Unfortunately, just this uh, this inter international route structure, I just think is going to take longer to recover, um, and as a result, will suffer uh, with respect to ramp. But but I do feel very good about it, and I do think uh, you know retirements are going to fuel a fair amount of our demand. Yeah, and, and I, just to add to it, Sheila, as you know uh, very well, when I mean, you look at the number of airplanes that are. 20 plus years old, and it's a significant, you know, significant amount. And then to Dave's point, at least, you know, with, we've been picking up on the customer side, you know, they'll be put down and won't be coming back up. And then when you look at 
what we have in the pipeline or in the backlog to some of those customers from an efficiency point of view, obviously, you know, there's significant improvements in it and it crosses the entire uh, product line. So um, we'll, we'll see how it goes. But I think, you know, across the globe, we're hearing uh, a lot more commitment to retiring that age fleet and to Dave's point, you know, retiring it for good and not bringing it back. And um, we'll continue to monitor that, obviously, and we, we will take that into, into account as we think about our production schedules going forward. Greg, just on that point, should we think about production in line with deliveries? Um, so production equates to deliveries for wide bodies in 2020 and 21 and beyond. Yeah, I think I think the only one that may be a little off is the, the transition from the triple uh, seven to triple seven X through that period as we're, you know, um, building um, the, the, the balance of the flight test airplanes. Um, but outside of that, you know, it, pretty pretty good correlation production rate to delivery rate. Okay, thank um, you. Of course, Max Max being unique, as sure. we talked earlier. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Our next question is from uh, John Raviv with City. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning. I'm just going to ask a question about the 45% of the business that is defense right now. Um, I think on the last call you mentioned that defense cash flow might be a little bit down year on year this year due to timing mostly, but how do you see that playing out um, going forward? And I ask that in the context also of a lot of the growth items in your defense portfolio being related to very new programs. We've taken on some risk uh, on the front end in terms of investments. How, how do you see those, those dynamics playing out over the next few years as a way to plug some of the hole being created by Aero uh, clearly being down here? Greg, you want to take that one, or, or you want me to? I'm oh, sorry, I, I I missed part of it. I apologize. It cut out on me. This is with respect to our defense business, and I'll I'll, I'll start with it. Um, um, yeah, you are you are in fact um, you know uh, correct. I, I uh, 2019 um, where we did have some balance, um, uh, the defense business was 45 percent. This year, of course, the defense business will probably be bigger. Uh, than the commercial business, and that will probably hold for a little while, um, of course, with these new rates and and deliveries. So um, yeah. this, that's an important uh, part of our company that I, I'm not sure a lot of uh, people reflect. Um, the risk elements associated with our defense portfolio now, I, I'm, I'm going to knock on wood while I say it, but I believe we've uh, de-risked much of our uh, uh, portfolio Largely as a result of the significant, uh, you know, uh, issues we've had on tanker, um, and uh, of course the continuous uh, uh, write-offs that we've had to experience, I do believe that that program now is exactly where it needs to be. Uh, we're going to finish well. Importantly, our customer is going to uh, uh, feel like we have finished well and we've delivered a product that uh, that, that is second to none. So I do believe that the, the, even the tanker future is, uh, is, is significantly brighter than, than the one we've experienced uh, up until now. Um, and then our, our fighter aircraft, we will continue to uh, uh, supplement or attempt to supplement our order stream and production build, um, and largely with the help of a defense department whose posture is to want to do those kinds of things, uh, particularly in this, this moment in time. So, uh, again, feel good about that. And on the development front, our development programs at the early stages are, are all looking quite good. We're, not, we're really not off plan on anything, um, and usually by now we have a sniff that we might be. Um, so, uh, again, I feel uh, pretty good about the risk profile of our defense business, um, despite the difficulties that we've, uh, that we've attempted to overcome in just the last couple of years. Uh, Greg, I'm not sure yeah. if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, no, I agree with everything you said, Dave. And obviously, when you look at the portfolio mix, uh, John, that max ramp up, that's where it'll start to differentiate, um, go go back to um, a richer mix on the commercial side. But um, outside of that, you know, I think it's, I think it's pretty much the way Dave out, outlined it. And um, on the development programs, as Dave said, you know, we've tried to de-risk a lot of these up front, especially some of those uh, wins that we had most recently, and outside of that, you know, the, the portfolio is actually performing performing well, as is the uh, BGS government services side of the business. So we got to keep that keep that engine uh, running running smoothly as well. Thanks. I'll keep it to one. Okay, operator, we Thanks, have John. time for one more question. 
And that will be from uh, Miles Walton with UBS. Please go ahead. Thanks. Good morning. Thanks for taking the question. Hey, Greg, in a prior question, I think you, you talked about 2022 cash flow, free cash flow as being kind of the pointing uh, north for us to look at. I'm just curious, in 21, is there any reason we shouldn't expect that to be a sizable positive cash flow year given the liquidation you're talking about on the max? Or are the advances headwinds enough for 21 um, to also be negative? Yeah, no, um, definitely 21 is, is uh, at least as we have a forecast of the day, much better than 20. Um, a, a lot of uh, key elements in that is is certainly the max again. The profile of the max deliveries coming off the ramp and the production. Um, there is a there is more impact on the progress payment side, but again, as I talked about operationally on the 787, we're still you know seeing good cash conversion on the program. Um, and then and like I said. Um, you know, 777X has improved um, from a cash burn um, in 21 as well. So, uh, you know, lots of moving pieces as there always is, but the single biggest driver in there is is max, the, the rate ramp on max. And that's what will contribute to a much more improved 2021 versus 2020. But, but Sorry, Greg, just to underline that, though, improved, is it positive? Do you, do you kind of feel comfortable enough to say that? Yeah, our our, our Current forecast, based on all the rate discussions we just had today, is is a positive 2021 cash flow. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right. So that completes uh, Boeing Company's first quarter 2020 earnings conference call. Thank you all for joining. Ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude your conference for today. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.